Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice Jay, and this is a show where we get you ready for a great night's sleep with some old familiar stories that you haven't heard in a while. Links to every story can be found in the show notes at our website, bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight we continue our story, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, by Edgar Allan Poe. In the opinion of Dumas, Mademoiselle L'Espagne had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered. The left tibia much splintered, as well as the ribs of the left side. Whole body dreadfully bruised and discolored. It was not possible to say how the injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club of wood or a broad bar of iron, a chair, any large, heavy, and obtuse weapon would have produced such results if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by witness, was entirely separated from the body and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut with some very sharp instrument, possibly with a razor. Alexandre Etienne, surgeon, was called with Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of Dumas. Nothing farther of importance was elicited, although several other persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder has been committed at all. The police are entirely at fault, an unusual occurrence in affairs of this nature. There is not, however, the shadow of a clue apparent. The morning edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in the court of saint Rome, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of witnesses instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe Le Bon had been arrested and imprisoned, although nothing appeared to incriminate him beyond the facts already detailed. Dupin seemed singularly interested in the progress of this affair, at least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments. It was only after the announcement that Le bon had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with old Paris in considering them an insoluble mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderer. We must not judge all the means, said Dupin, by this shell of an examination. The Parisian police, so much extolled for acumen, are cunning, but no more. There is no method in their proceedings beyond the method of the moment. They make a vast parade of measures, but not unfrequently they are so ill-adapted to the objects proposed as to put us in mind of Monsieur Jardin's calling for his robe de chambre pour mieux entendre la musique. The results attained by them are not unfrequently surprising, but for the most part are brought about by simple diligence and act. When these qualities are unavailing, their schemes fail. Bidoc, for example, was a good guesser and a persevering man, but Without educated thought, he erred continually by the very intensity of his investigation. He impaired his vision by holding the object too close. He might see perhaps one or two points with unusual clearness. But in doing, but in so doing, he necessarily lost sight of the matter as a whole. Thus, there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her, and not upon the mountaintops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at a star by glances, to view it in a sidelong way, by turning toward it the exterior portions of the retina, more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly is to have the best appreciation of its luster, a luster which grows dim just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually fall upon the eye in the latter case, but in the former there is a more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity we perplex an enfeeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venice herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, 
or to direct. As for these murders, let us enter into some examinations for ourselves before we make up an opinion respecting them. An inquiry will afford us amusement. I thought this an odd term, so applied, but said, And besides, Le Bon once rendered me a service for which I am not ungrateful. We will go and see the premises with our own eye. I know G, the prefect of police, and shall have no difficulty in obtaining the necessary. The permission was obtained, and we proceeded at once to the Rue Morgue. This is one of those miserable thoroughfares which intervene between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue Saint-Roche. It was late in the afternoon when we reached it, as this quarter is at a great distance from that in which we resided. The house was readily found, for there were still many persons gazing up at the closed shutters with an objectless curiosity. From the opposite side of the way, it was an ordinary house, with a gateway on one side of which was a glazed watchbox with a sliding panel in the window, indicating a loge de concierge. Before going in, we walked up the street, turned down an alley, and then, again turning, paused in the rear of the building Dupin, meanwhile examining the whole neighborhood, as well as the house, with a minuteness of attention for which I could see no possible object. Retracing our steps, we came again to the front of the dwelling, rang, and having shown our credentials, were admitted by the agents in charge. We went up the stairs into the chamber where the body of Mademoiselle d'Espagne had been found, and where both the deceased still lay. The disorders of the room had, as usual, been suffered to exist. I saw nothing beyond what had been stated in the Gazette de Tribunal. Dupin scrutinized everything, not accepting the bodies of the victims. We then went into the other rooms and into the yard, a gendarme accompanying us throughout. The examination occupied us until dark, when we took our departure. On our way home, my companion stepped in for a moment at the office of one of the daily papers. I have said that the whims of my friend were manifold, and, and that je les marais. For this phrase, there is no English equivalent. It was his humor, now, to decline all conversation on the subject of the murder until about noon the next day. He then asked me, suddenly, if I had observed anything peculiar at the scene of the atrocity. There was something in the manner of emphasizing the word peculiar, which caused me to shudder, without knowing why. No, nothing peculiar, I said. Nothing more, at least, than we both saw stated in the paper. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the unusual horror of the thing, but dismissed the idle opinions of the print. It appears to me that this mystery is considered insoluble, for the very reason which should cause it to be regarded as easy of solution. I mean for the outer character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled, too, by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention, but the facts that no one was discovered upstairs but the assassinated Mademoiselle L'Espagne, and that there were no means of egress without the notice of the party ascending. The wild disorder of the room, the corpse thrust, with the head downward, up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady, these considerations, with those just mentioned and others which I need not mention, have suffered to paralyze the powers by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They've fallen into the gross but common error of confounding the unusual with the abstruse. But it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the true. In investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much asked what has occurred, as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the facility with which I shall arrive, or have arrived, at the solution of this mystery is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now waiting, continued he, looking toward the door of our apartment. I am now awaiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of these butcheries, must have been in some measure implicated in their perpetration. Of the worst portion of the crimes committed, it is probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. 
I look for the man here in this room every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him. Here are pistols, and we both know how to use them when occasion demands their use. I took the pistols, scarcely knowing what I did or believing what I heard, while Dupin went on, very much as if in a soliloquy. I've already spoken of his abstract manner of such times. His discourse was addressed to him myself, but his voice, although by no means loud, had that intonation which is commonly employed in speaking to someone at a great distance. His eyes, vacant in expression, regarded only the wall. That the voice is heard in contention, he said, by the party upon the stairs were not the voices of the women themselves, was fully proved by the evidence. This relieves us of all doubt upon the question whether the old lady could have first destroyed the daughter and afterward have committed suicide. I speak at this point chiefly for the sake of method, for the strength of Madame L'Espagne would have been utterly unequal to the task of thrusting her daughter's corpse up the chimney as it was found, and the nature of the wounds upon her own person entirely preclude the idea of self-destruction. Murder, then, has been committed by some third party, and the voices of this third party were those heard in contention. Let me now advert not to the whole testimony respecting these voices, but to what was peculiar in that test. Did you observe anything peculiar about it? I remarked that, while all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, there was much disagreement in regard to the shrill, or as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. That was the evidence itself, said Dupin, but it was not the peculiarity of the evidence. You have observed nothing distinctive, yet there was something to be observed. The witnesses, as you remark, agreed about the gruff voice. They were here unanimous. But in regard to the shrill voice, the peculiarity is not that they disagreed, but that while an Italian, an Englishman, a Spaniard, a Hollander, and a Frenchman attempted to describe it, each one spoke of it as that of a foreigner. Each is sure that it was not the voice of one of his own countrymen. Each likens it not to the voice of an individual of any nation with whose language he is conversant, but the converse. The Frenchman supposed it the voice of a Spaniard and might have distinguished some words had he been acquainted with the Spanish. The Dutchman maintains it to have been that of a Frenchman, but we find it stated that not understanding French, this witness was examined through an interpreter. The Englishman thinks it was the voice of a German and does not understand German. The Spaniard is sure that it was that of an Englishman, but judges by the intonation altogether as he has no knowledge of the English. The Italian believes it to be the voice of the Russian, but has never conversed with the native of Russia. A second Frenchman differs, moreover, with the first, and is positive that the voice was that of an Italian, but not being cognizant of that tongue is, like the Spaniard, convinced by the intonation. Now, how strangely unusual must that voice have really been? about which such testimony as this could have been elicited, and whose tones even, denizens of the five great divisions of Europe could recognize nothing familiar. You will say that it might have been the voice of an Asiatic or an African. Neither Asiatics nor Africans abound in Paris, but without denying their inference, I will now merely call your attention to three points. The voice is turned by one witness, harsh rather than shrill. It is represented by two others to have been quick and unequal. No words, no sounds resembling words, or by any witness mentioned as distinguishable. I know not, continued Dupin, what impression I may have made so far upon your own understanding, but I do not hesitate to say that legitimate deductions, even from this portion of the testimony, the portion respecting the gruff and shrill voices, are in themselves sufficient to engender a suspicion which should give direction to all further progress in the investigation of the mist. I said legitimate deductions, but my meaning is not thus fully expressed. I design to imply that the deductions are the sole proper ones, and that the suspicion arises inevitably from them as the single result. The suspicion is, however, I will not say just yet. I merely wish you to bear in mind that with myself it was sufficiently forcible to give a definite form a certain tendency to my inquiries in the chamber. 
Let us now transport ourselves in fancy to this chamber. What shall we first seek here? The means of egress employed by the murderers. It is not too much to say that neither of us believe in preternatural events. Madame and Mademoiselle Espagne were not destroyed by spirits. The doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. And how? Fortunately, there is but one mode of reasoning upon the point, and that mode must lead us to a definite decision. Let us examine, each by each, the possible means of egress. It is clear that the assassins were in the room where Mademoiselle Espagne was found, or at least in the room adjoining, when the party ascended the stairs. It is then only from these two apartments that we have to seek issues. The police have laid bare the floors, the ceilings, and the masonry of the walls in every direction. No secret issues could have escaped their vigilance. But, not trusting to their eyes, I examined with my own. There were then no secret issues. Both doors leading from the rooms into the passage were securely locked, with the keys inside. Let us turn to the chimneys. These, although of ordinary width for some eight or ten feet above the hearts, will not admit, throughout their extent, the body of a large cat. The impossibility of egress, by means already stated, being thus absolute, we are reduced to the windows. Through those of the front room no one could have escaped without notice from the crowd in the street. The murderers must have passed, then, through those of the back room. Now, brought to this conclusion in so unequivocal a manner as we are, it is not our part as reasoners to reject it on account of apparent impossibilities. It is only left for us to prove that these apparent impossibilities are, in reality, not such. There are two windows in the chamber. One of them is unobstructed by furniture and is wholly visible. The lower portion of the other is hidden from view by the head of the unwieldy bedstead, which is thrust close up against it. The former was found securely fastened from within. It resisted the utmost force of those who endeavored to raise it. A large gimlet hole had been pierced in its frame to the left, and a very stout nail was found fitted therein, nearly to the head. Upon examining the other window, a similar nail was seen similarly fitted in it, and a rigorous attempt to raise this sash failed also. The police were now entirely satisfied that egress had not been in these directions. It was thought a matter of supererogation to withdraw the nails and open the windows. My own examination was somewhat more particular, and was so for the reason I have just given, because here it was. I know that all apparent impossibilities must be proved to be not such in reality. I proceeded to think thus posteriori. The murderers did escape from one of these windows. This being so, they could not have refastened the sashes from the inside as they were found fastened. The consideration which put a stop, through its obviousness, to the scrutiny of the police in this quarter. Yet the sashes were fastened. They must then have the power of fastening themselves. There was no escape from this conclusion. I stepped to the unobstructed casement, withdrew the nail with some difficulty, and attempted to raise the sack. It resisted all my efforts as I had anticipated. A concealed spring must, I now knew, exist, and this corroboration of my idea convinced me that my premises, at least, were correct. However mysterious still appeared, the circumstances attending the nails. A careful search soon brought to light the hidden spring. I pressed it, and, satisfied with the discovery, forbore to upraise the sash. I now replaced the nail and regarded it attentively. A person passing out through this window might have reclosed it, and the spring would have caught, but the nail could not have been replaced. The conclusion was plain, and again narrowed in the field of my investigations. The assassins must have escaped through the other window. Supposing, then, the springs upon each sash to be the same, as was probable, there must be found a difference between the nails, or at least between the modes of their fixture. Getting upon the sacking of the bedstead, I looked over the headboard minutely at the second casement. Passing my hand down behind the board, I readily discovered and pressed the spring, which was, as I had supposed, identical in character with its neighbor. I now looked at the nail. It was as stout as the other, and apparently fitted in the same manner driven in nearly up to the head. You will say that I was puzzled, but if you think so, 
you must have misunderstood the nature of the inductions. To use a sporting phrase, I had not been once at fault. The scent had never for an instant been lost. There was no flaw in any link of the chain. I had traced this secret to its ultimate result, and that result was the nail. It had, I say in every respect, the appearance of its fellow in the other window, but this fact was an absolute nullity, conclusive as it might seem to be, when compared with the consideration that here, at this point, terminated the clue. There must be something wrong, I said, about the nail. I touched it, and the head, with about a quarter of an inch of the shank, came off in my fingers. The rest of the shank was in the gimlet hole, where it had been broken off. The fracture was an old one, for its edges were encrusted with rust, and had apparently been accomplished by the blow of a hammer, which had partially embedded in the top of the bottom sash, the head portion of the nail. I now carefully replaced this head portion in the indentation whence I had taken it, and the resemblance to a perfect nail was complete. The fissure was invisible. Pressing the spring, I gently raised the sash for a few inches. The head went up with it, remaining firm in its bed. I closed the window, and the semblance of the whole nail was again perfect. The riddle so far was now unriddled. The assassin had escaped the window, which looked upon the bed. Dropping of its own accord upon his exit, or perhaps purposely closed, it had become fastened by the spring, and it was the retention of the spring which had been mistaken by the police for that of the nail. Farther inquiry being thus considered unnecessary. The next question is that of the mode of descent. Upon this point I had been satisfied in my walk with you around the building. About five feet and a half from the casement in question, there runs a lightning rod. From this rod, it would have been impossible for anyone to reach the window itself, to say nothing of entering it. I observed, however, that the shutters of the fourth story were of the peculiar kind called by Parisian coffers for rods, a kind rarely employed at the present day, but frequently seen upon very old mansions at Lyon and Bordeaux. They are in the form of an ordinary door, a single, not a folding door, except that the lower half is latticed or worked in open trellis, thus affording an excellent hold for the hands. In the present instance, these shutters are fully three feet half broad. When we saw them from the rear of the house, they were both about half open. That is to say, they stood off at right angles from the wall. It is probable that the police, as well as myself, examined the back of the tenement. But, if so, in looking at these farads in the line of their breadth as they must have done, they did not perceive this great breadth itself, or at all events failed to take it into due consideration. In fact, having once satisfied themselves that no egress could have been made in this quarter, they would naturally bestow here a very cursory examination. It was clear to me, however, that the shutter belonging to the window at the head of the bed would, if swung fully back to the wall, reach to within two feet of the lightning rod. It was also evident that, by exertion of a very unusual degree of activity and courage, an entrance into the window from the rod might have been thus effected. By reaching to the distance of two feet and a half, we now suppose the shutter open to its whole extent, a robber might have taken a firm grasp upon the trellis work, letting go then his hold upon the rod, placing his feet securely against the wall and springing boldly from it, he might have swung the shutter as to close it, and if we imagine the window opened at the time, might even have swung himself into the room. I wish you to bear especially in mind that I have spoken of a very unusual degree of activity, as requisite to success in his hazardous and so difficult a feat. It is my design to show you, first, that the thing might possibly have been accomplished, but secondly and chiefly I wish to impress upon your understanding the very extraordinary, the almost preternatural character of that agility which could have accomplished it. You will say, no doubt, using the language of the law, that, to make out my case, I should rather undervalue than insist upon a full estimation of the activity required in this matter. This may be the practice in law, but it is not the usage of reason. My ultimate object is only the truth. My immediate purpose is to lead you to place in juxtaposition that very unusual activity of which I have just spoken, with that very peculiar shrill or harsh and unequal voice, about whose nationality no two persons could be found to agree, 
and in whose utterance no syllabification could be detected. At these words, a vague and half-formed conception of the meaning of Dupin fitted into my mind. I seemed to be on the verge of comprehension, without power to comprehend as men, at times, find themselves upon the brink of remembrance, without being able, in the end, to remember. My friend went on with his discourse. You will see, he said, that I have shifted the question from the mode of egress to that of ingress. It was my design to convey the idea that both were effected in the same manner at the same point. Let us now revert to the interior of the room. Let us sever the appearances here. The drawers of the bureau, it is said, had been rifled, although many articles of apparel still remained within them. The conclusion here is absurd. It is a mere guess, a very silly one, and no more. How are we to know that the articles found in the drawers were not all these drawers had originally contained? We'll continue this story on our next episode. I want to remind you that we're always on the lookout for great stories to feature on this show. You can email them to me, bigvoicej at gmail.com. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>